so hi everybody and welcome. Uh, my name is Lindsay Hardy. My pronouns are she and her and I am the uh, project director of the Energy Challenge here at the Environmental Center. We're joined here today in this virtual reality with um, Neil Bonsgar, one of our program managers of the Energy Challenge and he's going to be moderating uh, some Q&A later today so you'll get to see his face as well. Uh, today we are kicking off the 20th annual Green Tour so I'm going to introduce um, Sam now. And Sam, if you um, wanna come join us here on the screen, you can, and I will um, transfer over control to you. All right, so um, Sam is the Chief Architect of the Department of Energy's Building Technologies Office. He's the primary, his primary role is leading deployment of proven innovations for new and existing high performance homes. And in his prior position with the Energy Star for Homes um, program that he had was uh, with since its inception in 1996, he's worked with more than 8,000 builder partners and labeled over a million um, energy efficient homes. Uh, we're very uh, pleased and excited that this is a silver lining of a virtual reality that Sam can join us from um, DC today and share some of his really important work and insights uh, into this uh, conversation. So thank you, Sam, and we look forward um, to hearing from you. Um, throughout this uh, presentation, please feel free to chat in your questions via the chat on Zoom and Facebook, and we will have a live Q&A with Sam uh, after he is done. All right, thank you all. Hey, thank you, Lindsay, and welcome, everyone. Uh, first thing I tell you is this is COVID, so sure enough, I got my house cleaning process underway, so you'll hear some vacuum noise in the back. I'm sure my dog will bark once or twice. There'll be all sorts of uh, normal virtual uh, uh, distractions, but we'll power through. And the most important thing I wanna say is, um, this is extraordinary time. I mean, I, for all of you in this particular audience, if you are based out in the Northwest, my heart's out to all the struggles and the absolute uh, disruption all these wildfires are causing, all the air quality concerns. I, I can't imagine how difficult it is and uh, I really appreciate you here today. Uh, take time to, to get some new content. But you know, this is an historic time. I mean, we, we have you know, these incredible climate crises. We have the economic crises, the health crises social justice crises. Uh, it, it's just, this is, this is almost impossible to figure out where things are going. So I'm gonna try to take us back to some basic, um, basic skill sets that we have to figure out because all these crises point to the imperative that we have to have high performance homes, probably more zero energy homes has to be the imperative. And we got to figure out how to sell these homes. We got to be so effective, making the invisible visible. So when Lindsay approached me about what to do for today's topic, this came up and uh, things weren't quite as crazy when we first discussed this topic, but hopefully while you're surrounded with all this chaos in your lives, we can just spend some time and think about this really important skill. And I'll explain retooling the US housing industry first, uh, because I'm not wearing my Department of Energy hat right now. I'm also an author, an author who came to writing not intentionally. I was doing Energy Star Certified Homes from its inception in 1996, 1995 was the development time, and we we're having great success. Uh, Lindsay spoke to the fact that, you know, we got to a million homes, now two million homes. So it was great, but I'm coming back from a trip, doing some training, trying to get builders to, I think, version two of Energy Star Certified Homes. And a lightning bolt struck me right about 2010. And if you remember, that was a pretty downtime for the housing industry, uh, massive recession. And I realized no matter how much success I had, I was really having the privilege to see the entire depth and breadth of the industry across the entire country and how sub-optimized the industry I love really is. And that led me to write Retooling the U.S. Housing Industry. How do we basically address all this suboptimized uh, uh, product that we're delivering? Not because we're bad, but 
it's time just to look at what we could do better. And it was great that the book came out, but it really needed some massive vetting. There's so much new ideas and thinking. So that begat the retooling executive builder workshops for about five plus years. We brought in hundreds and hundreds of other executives to run through, here's this framework. Here's how we could optimize the ultimate consumer product. What are we missing? What do we need to adjust? What are things that need to be deleted? And feedback, rinse, wash, repeat, keep doing this. And that's finally led me to Housing 2.0, uh, uh, a guide for surviving disruption for the housing industry. And that's that book's coming out in December. But a lot of what you're getting now isn't from the Department of Energy. It's from this ability to engage such high level executives in the industry and really come up with a framework for how to make homes optimized at every level. And the first thing I, 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 I cobbled together was what are these consumer experiences that drive almost every product? And there you go in the background, we'll start getting a few noises already. But what are these consumer experiences? And it really came down from every view I could take of almost any consumer product, there are five key experiences. The company, the design, performance, quality, and sales. And that led me to say, well, this is easy to come up with a spider diagram assessment tool to really judge almost any product. And I can take one of my favorite products, which is almost any Apple computer, iPod, or, uh, or iPhone, or take whatever Apple product you want. And you realize basically they're almost nailing every experience exceptionally well. They're a company that delivers more than you expect their designs are obsessively focused on every aspect of what makes a product feel and work and, and just function great. The performance is always intuitive and easy. The quality is always just impeccable, at least for the half-life of what we expect from IT products. And the sales experience is extraordinary from the store design to the interiors, to the way all the products are laid out. And when you nail all these experiences, you can look at the success of a company like Apple where you can fit all their products, the entire portfolio products on a single conference table and they have more money in the bank than the U.S. Treasury, which may not be saying a lot right now, but it is saying a lot. It, it, it's amazing what happens if you deliver in all five key experiences. So taking this, we can also look at how fragile this is. You get one experience wrong and you could be doomed. So take a company like Volkswagen, very respectable, makes really good design products, good performance cars, quality and sales, and they get one experience wrong, the company experience, the ethics, integrity of the company, lying about the diesel emissions, and it can virtually tank the entire business. So they get the company experience wrong and everything goes down. Or take Toyota and the Prius. The first generation Prius looked like a derivative of a Toyota Corolla. What were they thinking? Here's a transformative transportation solution. The first meaningful move up from an internal combustion engine and they package it in a car that looks like a basic Corolla. Really horrible design and sales suffered immensely. As soon as they went to the advanced aerodynamic design unique to the Prius, the sales went up huge. Incredible, if you get one thing wrong, you fail. Take Samsung, go figure, people don't like when their batteries catch on fire in their cell phone. But there was this new Galaxy 8 or 9, batteries catching on fire, and with that crisis of confidence on the performance of the product, that it would battery catch on fire, and a great uh, smartphone product completely tanked until they could restore consumer confidence. Or take quality, Chipotle was on the leading fastest growing fast food companies in the country. An incredible growth and hardly any advertising. And they got one thing wrong, quality. They had infected products, tainted products, and then no one would touch their stores. You get one experience wrong and it fails. And lastly on sales, Wells Fargo. They went into a incredib incredibly fraudulent sales practice of overselling, over transactions for their customers. They got caught 
and completely devastated their business. One of my mom's investment managers was from Wells Fargo, moved to another company. It was so bad, he had to change companies and, and bring all our accounts over with him. It's a five-legged stool. You got to get all five legs right to be tremendous success. So when I take it to housing, I realized I had to flip the company experience for community experience and otherwise all the experiences translate for housing just as it would for any product. The reason why you don't care about company as much is when you only buy a product once or twice, maybe three times in a lifetime, you buy a brand new builder built home, usually once or twice, you don't know the company. You don't have, you know, the company experience isn't baked in before you go buy a home. But if you don't have the right community experience, location, location, location. So it's the same community design, performance, quality, and sales for housing, same construct in terms of how we look at housing. And this is where I came at after traveling 80,000 miles a year, going to visit builder after builder, market after market. I just was overwhelmed by how sub-optimized housing was. I'm a tough grader, but this is the way I scored the industry after viewing tens and tens and tens of thousands of homes. This is what I was saying. And this is what I do when I get people to zero energy. I bump up one experience fully aware that the impact on that individual company builder will be minimal because you have to deliver five customer experiences. And so, of course, the informed consumer is coming to the housing industry. It could not be the only industry where star rate ratings was not going to happen when we began retooling, we predicted it was gonna happen right away. It took one or two years, maybe longer than we thought, but sure enough, now there are six or seven different consumer sites for getting home builder ratings. And imagine spending three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 on a product that's a three, two, or one star rating. It's the ultimate filter for if you're gonna be successful getting customers to consider your product. So this is where you have to be eventually. This is the concept of housing 2.0. How do you get here? How do you optimize all five experiences? And think of it almost like a Trojan horse for how we get zero into housing by helping the best high performance builders do everything right. And now it's so much easier. And, and the big thing about it is that the strategies have huge opportunities to save cost and add value. And it's all about how you optimize materials for space, integration, quality choice, satisfaction, cycle time, productivity. There's a whole framework for how we do these cost savings and for adding value. There's a whole framework for how we optimize lot, site, nature, function, performance, quality protection experts. All this is what I do with Housing 2.0 across all five experiences. And the outcome is amazing. We can save 25 to 60% of either cost savings and or added value per home. That's a huge amount of additional resources, only a fraction of which is needed to get to zero. Again, the Trojan horse. This is how we get the entire industry to zero because there's so much sub-optimization. This is what I do with Housing 2.0. And this is where we are gonna be for the rest of this webinar. We're gonna talk about a little bit about sales, part of what I do when I, when I train builders. But I want, it's so important that this segment of the industry, the high performance building segment of the industry knows how to sell effectively. And the key thing I wanna talk about is giving you a toolkit. There's seven behavior change strategies that to my amazement, are just so underutilized and so effective, proven with research after research and data after data study. We know these work and they're so underutilized. I'm gonna walk you through as much as I can. I only have an hour. I may have to accelerate at the end to get, to get you to the end, but it's not important that we cover everything in full detail. I just wanna give you a sense of just how much opportunity there is to be more effective selling high performance or zero energy or zero net carbon or whatever you're building, these strategies are proven. And the seven strategies are starting with why, learning to ask probing questions, using power words, integrating sticky messages. So what you say doesn't leave the second that it, you deliver it, it stays with the, with the customer. Maximizing clarity with contrast, clarity is critical 
providing emotional experiences, and earning trust. All these seven are what I teach to. So we're gonna start with the why, behavior change number one. And uh, again, everything is science and research and based on studies. So, you know, James Collins, good to great, was a seminal work that's, you know, you look at it now and it's a little bit dated, but his companies were remarkable in that they, over 10 years, they, they were delivering 330 plus percent return to investors. But you look at purpose-driven companies, what they call firms of endearment, and you study the companies that really are just anchored in their why. And over 10 years, they deliver over a thousand percent return to investors. Knowing your why is incredibly important. And I don't know that anyone has been as effective vocalizing this whole concept as Simon Sinek. He has a famous TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's 17 minutes worth your time. Just go to TED Talk, search Simon Sinek, it'll come right up. And it, the basic concept is how often we get lost on the how and what. Um, and the why is there to inspire and truly gain people's interest in what you're saying, what you're selling, what you're doing, and how and what are just way, way outside the circle. You've got to get focused on that core. You've got to know your core. And you just look around and look at great examples where companies know their core. Again, with Apple, we build products people never knew they wanted, but have to have once they try them. Building products people have to have is good business. And that's your core and you are just obsessively focused on giving that, that kind of product to the market. That's a great why. Tesla, to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport. You know, they, you know, everyone was just stuck on the internal combustion engine. I remember when I worked at the California Energy Commission, I carpooled with the manager of the methane fuel program. He, uh, this manager was just a madman for trying to get methane fuel to replace gasoline. It didn't look like a big, a big enough advantage to me. I kept suggesting to him, why not electric cars? So this was in the 80s. And I thought he was going to chop my head off. He was so angry at the idea of electric transport. But electric is inspiring. It is so clean. And it's an amazing why that just has driven this company to incredible heights. And then even simple companies that or simple product companies like you don't have to be IT, it could be just like coffee. And look at the why for Starbucks to inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. You know, when you're anchored in your why and you know what you do and you, you just you just everything else flows from that. And I'll, I'll be walking through an airport after one of my retooling workshops. This was in Tampa. And I'll just see this typical builder ad. I'm going, why are they wasting their money? There is no why message. It's, what is, it's just the name of a builder. It is, it is like no discipline to really think about how to really engage and leverage behavior change. And this is a website for another major national builder. And you go, you go to the webpage, shouldn't there be some message about why I should care about this company? It's just trying to get me to start searching for a home right away. So compare that to, again, some builders that I loved working with in my workshops. One was Newtown Builders. And you know, within uh, months after I think they're at the workshop, they transitioned to become Thrive Home Builders. Many of you know Thrive, they're just, now I almost would say world famous for their dedication to their why. And the why is all built around their name. I mean, think about it, what does Newtown mean? You can name your company anything you want. Shouldn't the name have some inspirational element? So Newtown meant nothing. And G. Meyer, the owner of Newtown said, Thrive. He really, again, he soul searched. He looked inside himself to why am I doing what I'm doing? And then everything builds around that. Your home should help you thrive. Ours does. Your home should help pay your energy bill. Ours does. Your home should make you healthier. Ours does. Your home should be built by your neighbors. Ours are. 
local health energy. He knew that you could see what a wonderful design product, what a wonderful community. He chose his why to be the invisible, what you can't see and to make it fully transparent. Compare it to that Toll Brothers website and just think about the contrast and impact when you get to that splash page of one message versus the other. Uh, here's another builder. I'm, I'm good friends with Ted Benson. He owns Unity Homes. He used, used to be Bensonwood Homes. And let's take advantage when we have someone's eyeballs on our webpage. Let's talk about a better way to build. Let's talk about homes that are extraordinarily comfortable, superb indoor air quality, easily and inexpensively maintained. Homes are quieter than they thought you thought they could be. So you kind of get my idea. First, get yourself angry. Know what your product is and start inspiring people right away. Behavior change strategy number two, ask discovery questions. Good friend of mine, Gord Cook, did a famous study, oh, one or two decades ago. He had like 30 different or 20 different couples pose as mystery couples shopping for homes. And the finding going to all these major production builders was how little questions were being asked, which was completely consistent with my experience, mystery shopping, thousands and thousands of homes. And again, the research is so compelling on the power of knowing how to ask the right questions. There are way too many books all about asking questions and what are the right questions. And so to bring some skills to bear, I love these five key discovery questions from one resource, because I think they're just so per pervasively applicable. It could be to a product or a house, they, they make sense. What's the outcome you're looking to achieve? You know, asking the buyer, what is the outcome they're after? What does success look like? And you're really trying to understand what's motivating the buyer. What's most important to you, what are, what's the sense of urgency? Why are they out shopping for the product today? What are you willing to commit to trying? Again, you wanna get the extent where the bar is. What are they afraid of? Where, you know, what are they willing to, how far are they willing to go? Understand their limits. And how do you see yourself growing moving forward? What's, what are their aspirations? What do they hope to get to? And then when you're getting to a point where is interest and connection and you start moving to the close, when are you looking to get in, get this in place? In other words, can I, can, what lot can I reserve for you today? Start the closing process. Specific end of asking questions and moving to the close. So I love these, these five questions. You know, just understand urgency, fear, aspirations, and closing all this system of questions addressing those key points. So I love from one reference. And, you know, there's some process here. You have to first ask if it's okay to ask questions. Many buyers are just looking. They don't want to be bothered. You, you shouldn't. Can I ask you a few questions? Uh, I find I'm often able to help buyers just better look at our homes and understand them better. And then you got to realize that you're in a process again of being like a detective. You, you know, the first answer you get is only going to help you get into a discovery process, process of the real underlying issues of, that each individual buyer cares about. What they value most, how they live, you've got to just figure that out somehow. That's, you, you can't begin to start selling until you understand the buyer at that level. And the questions if you ask long, complex questions, you're lost. There's no chance. And it has, the questions have to be interesting and encourage them to talk. And you know you're failing if you violate the 80-20 rule. You should be listening 80% and talking 20%. So it's a lot of listening. And then when you get your key points lined up that are relevant to that buyer, then you have something to say. And so here's some questions I've collected, I think are ones that are really important in selling homes. What do you like least living in your existing home or apartment? What do you like most living in your existing home apartment? What's working, what's not working? Why are you shopping for a new home? 
You know, what are the critical must-haves? How do you envision living in your next home? How you live is really, you gotta be able to speak to that. Do you have any concerns or special needs for any family members? And if you have kids with al allergies or asthma or breathing issues, uh, you need to know that, if, particularly if you're building a healthy home or if they have needs about just being uncomfortable in the old home or having high bills, all those position you to have something relevant in how you present your new home. Because you don't, you only have a chance to make three or four or five points. They have to be spot on. And do you have any must have features? You, must, you have to know what are the critical must haves and make sure you can check those boxes. Okay, enough on questions. The next topic is one of my favorites on behavior changes, power words. Uh, again, all these are based on research, extensive studies. We know words are immensely influential um, and they're free. You don't have to pay if you choose a really good word over a really bad word. There's no extra cost. It's all free, so choose the right ones. And I love this line from Rudyard Kipling. Words, of course, are the most powerful drug used by mankind. What we say is staggeringly impactful. And so with that in mind, I was listening to some presentation way, way too long ago. And I, I wrote down the notes because right away I knew it was a, a crazy important set of points. Words create pictures. Pictures create emotions. Emotions create attitudes. Attitudes create behavior. Behavior create habits. Habits create reality. This is why words are important. They start chain reactions. I, I can't even remember who said this, but to this day, I love how it anchors the power of words. And so what words are powerful? Words that build on experiences or emotions rather than function. Okay, words, words that build on experiences or emotion rather than function. So it's really difficult to sell Patagonian toothfish. It turns out the American seafood consuming public isn't interested in toothfish. The to toothfish would just sit on the shelves and rot. So the seafood industry experts got together and said, what do we do? Because this was a great texture fish, great color, get great taste, and yet it just would not sell. So they put their brilliant minds together and they changed it to the name just for free. At no extra cost, they just changed the name to Chilean sea bass. I presented this presentation some time ago and one of the audience members started getting really angry at me. Yeah, but now there's so much Chilean sea bass consumed, it almost was fished to extinction. I said, that's the point I'm trying to make. That's the power of words. Just by changing a name, a fish that was rotting on shells became almost extinct because of, it was such a popular fish just by changing the name. It's really difficult to sell prunes. You know, it, it's like associated with a biological need that is displeasing. It is associated with a older demographic. There's, it's kind of looks like an unsightly fruit product. It's really difficult to sell prunes. So sales are dropping precipitously. The California fruit growers got together. They huddled, huddled in a room just like the seafood industry did. And they changed the name to dried plums. And they said, hold on a minute. We can do even better. Let's make it really hip. California dried plums. Sales went up like 20, 25% almost in a few months right after the name change. For free, no cost. All they did were free, they chose some new words instead of prunes, California dried plums, and that's the power of words. And yet, you know, it, it's amazing how we don't get this even in the public domain. So uh, one political crowd really wants estate taxes because it's an important source of revenue and the wealthy contribute more to the public need. But another fraction doesn't want wealthy individuals to pay such high taxes. So they had to get the public opinion rallied against the estate tax. So they changed the name, death tax. 
Why should I pay all this taxes just because I die? Why is dying, a, 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 which is such a miserable experience, also entail all this requirement to pay taxes? And just by changing the name and the argument, everything flips. That's the power of words. It's really difficult to sell used cars. Who wants a used car? So instead we sell pre-owned cars. You kind of get where I'm going, right? We need to choose words. We need to spend the time and we don't. So in our own industry, why are we de delivering energy audits? You should strike this word from your vocabulary. It should never be used again. By a show of hands out there, I'm looking at every one of you. How many of you want to be audited? None of you do. Nobody wants an audit. Why would you name such a valuable process to help us understand the most expensive asset we own and how to get the most health, comfort, and durability out of it? Why would you call it an audit to do that kind of assessment? And if I, I still hear it to this day. I'm, I'm blue in the face on this one. Yet we understand the value of a checkup, don't we? You know, we bring our cars in for checkup. It's a very expensive asset. We don't want it to go out of condition, of course we'll bring it in for a checkup. Or our bodies, we go to a doctor for a checkup annually. We don't want to get into problems. In the same way, a checkup for our homes would just be such a risk mitigation strategy. It'd be so valuable for us. And the words are free. So none of you ever use audit again as an energy checkup. So you get the idea. It's really hard to sell the technical function. It's much easier to sell the consumer experience and emotions. So think about high performance products and let's start changing our vocabulary. Who wants a ventilation system? Tell me how many lay home buyers or clients for new homes are clamoring for a ventilation, ventilation system. How easier would they resonate with a fresh air system? No cost, it's free. You can call this whatever you want. But giving them a fresh air system is, I gotta believe is a hugely more effective way to use words for such a valuable device that, that balances and delivers fresh air every day. AD, 100,000 cubic feet of fresh filtered air every day. Why do we call it insulated sheathing or rigid insulated sheathing or rigid insulation sheathing? I mean, I, it's such a technical term. It's a thermal blanket. It's gonna wrap, make your house cozy in a big thermal blanket, continuous around your whole house. We can use any words we want. It's not an HVAC system. It's a comfort system. People don't even know what HVAC even means. You know, it just, this is about how do we optimize comfort? And we'll get out of the nonsense of worrying about who's got the bigger tonnage or less tonnage. It's all about optimizing comfort. And you see it within the industry. You know, the guys who make trust choice said, what can we deliver that people really resonate with? It's the silent floor, right? So let's get with using words. Let's drop this one. I don't know any consumer that can resonate with payback. There's no consumer transaction, none, where payback is part of the consideration in whether to make a purchase decision or not. And then we try to impose payback as a measure for changing behavior, for getting interest in our zero energy house or high performance home. Yet, if you look over 30 years of zero energy house or zero ready house without the solar, we'll save you know, around eight, 70, $80,000 over a 30 year mortgage. Would you like to improve the value of your home by 10,000 and lock in 80,000 of savings over 30 years? That's a much easier discussion. Instead, you want to wait five or six years to get your money back. So enough, we want to move from technical jargon to a language of value. That's the concept. Uh, I've tried to work with industry to put something together to help. It's the Building America Building Science Translator. You wouldn't believe how difficult it was for me to get interest by the industry in this one. I, I really, it was pulling teeth to get people to come to these meetings I was setting up. We got it pulled together. I'd say half of it's pretty good. The other half still needs a lot of work, but we have a basic product. You see it's from 2015, one of the early things I did when I got to the Department of Energy. 
The key thing I want to show you about the innovation with the building science translator, take one of the terms like higher window. Um, the new terminology would be high efficiency window. But what we realize is if words are free, why not have a different word for the same measure for different needs? So if I have a buyer that's really shopping for comfort, we have an enhanced comfort window. If I have a buyer that really cares about the indoor environment, how about the quiet window? If I have a buyer who cares about really an energy efficient house, how about the ultra efficient window? Or a technology buyer, how about advanced window technology? Or the buyer has a lot of expensive furnishings, how about the sun protection window? But if you have a good salesperson who's facile with all your key measures and understands all of its value propositions, there's no cost or limitation on how many terms you can use for each measure. So that's the innovation in the Building Science Translator. This document is a work in progress. I say half of it's pretty good. It's on the website. And hopefully all of us as a community can start working to get better words. Okay, enough about words. Let's get sticky. And we need to make sure that what we say doesn't just disappear out of the mind of our listeners the minute we're done. How do we have sticky messages? And um, I love this book by Chip and Dan Heath. They're kind of really innovative writers on lots of marketing type concepts and business concepts. And there are uh, six ways of really being sticky that they go into. Great stories, great examples. Simplicity, unexpectedness, concreteness, credibility, emotion, story. I'll go through a little bit of this, but you know, you, you can't you, you can't have what you say just disappear out of people's minds quickly. And again, it gets back to the why concept. A lot of these, all these different behavior change strategies all have overlap and cross-pollination. But again, knowing your single core really helps you be simple, doesn't it? So when Southwest Airlines first came out. They just priced their tickets at the lowest in the in industry. So they had their core nailed down. You know, this was the message, Southwest, the low fare airline. And so sometimes your core evolves. And over time, they stopped being the lowest car cost because they had a lot of good attributes to their services. So the new core now is not so much the lowest cost, but low fares with nothing to hide. So other airlines, you're paying extra fees, you're paying for check bags, you're paying for other services. We have no other costs. Low fares, nothing to hide. And again, they always have an effective, very simple message. There's so many other things about travel that keep it really simple. Walmart, of course, is famous and their core has not changed. Always low prices, always. And Disney has a one word sticky message of who they are at their core. And what's great, one word, easy to remember, magic. Whether it's the theme parks, whether it's the cruises, whether it's the movies, the toys, everything's focused on magic. That's what they do. That's the business they're in. They know what they do. Of course, it yields lots of success. So take our challenge with Zero Energy Ready Home, my label with the Department of Energy, we need a core. And how do we summarize everything about a zero energy home in three words that are simple? Zero lives better. That's what we came up with. And then when we message, everything we message is to justify our core that these homes live better. They live better because there's tens of thousands of savings, often more than $100,000 of savings over a 30 year mortgage. It lives better because it is so much lower cost. Well, this is better because it's just blanketed with all this pr pr protection. You have a cozy indoor, just cocoon of comfort. And then the comfort system itself takes comfort to a whole new level. And then you have all the recommenda recommendations by leading experts on how to provide a complete package of healthy living protection. And peace of mind from one of the most significant issues homeowners have, water protection. We have complete package of water protection and then quality assurance, diagnostics, testings, inspections, the federal government's most rigorous requirements for high performance, all baked in with this certification. And lastly, it's future ready. 
It's enhanced for the future. It meets and exceeds future codes. It meets and exceeds future customer expectations. This is why it lives better. So everything we do is about having a core and reinforcing the core. And then unexpectedness. You know, we, uh, one of the best examples, I think, in the Chip and Dan Heath book uh, is, I you know, Kennedy's famous commitment to go to the moon. I believe the nation should commit itself before the decade to landing on the moon and returning safely to Earth. It was such, a, you, you had to be alive at the time, but to hear that claim at that time, at that moment where space travel was, it just took your breath away. And the fact that the country delivered on that vision was just amazing, but the vision began it all. And I love the uh, state of Texas needed a campaign to reduce litter. And it was such an unexpected message because they took incredibly macho heroes, uh, sports heroes, Earl Campbell, uh, country western singers uh, who were just had the most macho personalities and they were out saying don't mess with Texas. This campaign was so successful, millions of dollars of money dedicated to a very costly uh, 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 punishment program for littering wasn't needed. It was such a successful campaign. So when I think about zero again, I always come back to this, don't I? I look at typical billboards and I'm always, you know, I'll see a million billboards traveling and it always shocks me that this is the best, like 99% of the billboards can do. Location, an exit number, and maybe a price range. And usually a price that's a um, misleading price because by the time you order extras, it's almost another 100,000, right? And it's, un, it's, it's totally expected. It's what everyone does. Why not do something people don't expect? Buy power bills $5, what's yours? It's pretty unexpected. It frames the value in a great way, very simple, garbage homes. So you kind of get how effective that is. And of course, emotions, we know anytime you can extract emotion, you're, you're gonna be sticky. Uh, again, for those of you listening, probably too young to remember the uh, Crying Indian campaign to stop littering. They had mostly TV commercials with an Indian on horseback traveling around in absolute desolate wilderness, seeing trash in the creek and on the ground and tears coming to his eyes. And it was really emotional. And of course, Smokey Bear is a famous public service campaign where you can prevent wildfires and showing damage from fires. And isn't that resonant now, right? So bring it back to zero and healthy homes, we threw away the inhaler, that was priceless. Now that's pretty emotional. So we have to figure out how to leverage these, th this opportunity. Okay, maximizing clarity with contrast. Number five, just move it along, not probably as fast as I should. And uh, a lot of the best thinking on this, um, I got from Daniel Pink's book a few years ago, To Sell as Human. I thought it was a really great book on sales that was contemporized for our times. And in particular, he was great on this concept about clarity and contrast. And we just understand like many X better value when we see something in comparison with something else than we see it in isolation. So my example would be shopping for car tires. I could not have less interest on any nuance about car tires. It just, of all products, I don't think I could care less about the details. I just want to buy a freaking tire. And so I need something to grab onto. So I can get a 40,000, 75,000, or 90,000 mile work tire. How long have I been on the car? I can make a quick decision. I'm out of there. They just make it so simple. The contrast is so easy to digest. It's durability is a great value proposition in tires. And we just don't do that in our industry. This is a window label. I know a lot of times the geeks out there want all the detail, but you get the detail way before the window arrives and it has a sticker on it. You've already been there. You've, you've done this. You're, this is just to confirm you got what you got. But a window is label is a great opportunity to communicate with, communicate with clarity and this is zero. How would a, lay homeowner, look at this, get anything out of it. So in contrast, this is an R3 window, 
versus an R7 window, basically. So essentially, I would relabel windows this way. The R3 window, not a 10 year window. In 10 years, it's no longer relevant. A 50 year window, R7 window, that will stand the test of time. So are you willing to spend another eight or seven thousand dollars for a 50 year window versus a 10 year window? That's a lot easier conversation, sales conversation, to up serve your customer with a better window. To try to explain all those technical concepts is insanity. This is how simple it could be. So take my world. You can do a code home, 2009 or 12, whatever. I can do Energy Star version three, which is anchored in 2009. Plus there's version one and version two, and now version three. There's versions 3.12 and, and more coming. Or I can do Zero Energy Ready Home, which is a better code 2015 actually, and Energy Star and Air Plus and Building America Innovations, and that's great. And there's FIAS, which is everything from uh, you know, basic code, Energy Star, Air Plus, Zero Ready, Building America, and more. So how do I sell all those things to a lay audience, right? Good luck. Is there some way we can simplify this? And go back to the prior example I just showed you. A code home is a five-year home. It will be obsolete in five years. An Energy Star home, uh, I'll be generous. Ten years and it'll be obsolete. A zero energy, zero energy ready home is a 50-year home. A passive home is a 100-year home. How much easier would it be to sell passive house if this is what we told consumers? You want a 100-year house? You want a 50, 10, 5? We just make it so hard on ourselves. It doesn't have to be this complex and that hard. So we really have to figure out this clarity concept really well. It's, it makes it so much more simple. From the very beginning, one of the very first things we did it in its inception was develop comparison contrast because we knew we had this 800 pound gorilla energy star out there. And how do we justify moving up to zero ready? So let's say someone came in a sales office and you asked the right questions, remember discovery questions, and you ask, do you have any special needs when you're next to your house? And they tell you the kids are inhalers and have trouble breathing, boom, you get out the thick marker circle healthful environment and you're able to say to Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we have 100% of all the recommended measures, best practices for protecting the air you breathe every day for you and your children. In contrast, you get half of those recommendations with Energy Star and hardly any in the existing home. When you agree, shopping for a home where your kids can breathe well every day, you want a zero energy ready home. Once you have clarity, you have a sense of purpose, you have a communication um, target that is so powerful. So I can't say enough about how important clarity is. Remember we do, you can circle comfort if someone's out because the last home they were just always just freezing in the winter, they told you. Or if there are technology buyers, you talk about how you have 100% of the technology recommendations versus hardly you know, half of them in Energy Star or same with efficient or quality durability. It all the same thing. The leading experts say we should have this. And the leading experts happen to be all these world-class researchers and building science experts working with DOE and our community, and this is what they recommend, and Energy Star is only this, and, and existing homes only that. We had to contrast zero ready with Energy Star and show it was worth the simple lift to get to zero ready. That's what we had to do. Okay, behavior change strategy number six, provide emotional experiences. And again, all this is based on research about effectiveness of experiences and why they really matter and so forth. And the sales axioms have been around forever. They, they tell us this anyway, before the research. We retain 15% of what we hear versus 90% 90, 90 of what we experience. If we're not creating experiences, we're just seven times less effective or six times less effective. And the other key thing is people buy an emotion and they justify with facts. So if you can create emotion, again, you're five, six, seven X ahead of the game. So here's one that amazes me. I've been touting the infrared camera for ages. Uh, about six, seven years ago, I got up in front of the governor 
Colorado after he spoke and I said, this is going to transform the housing industry, the infrared camera. And it's taken longer than I predicted, but I finally have proof that it's as transformative as I promised. So this is a famous study that was done, Bristol, England, uh, the man who makes you see the invisible. And it, uh, Plymouth University psychologists uh, in 2014, they went to thousands of households with energy assessments, not energy audits, uh, and they measured and compared how many times buyers engaged in the recommended energy assessment improvements when there was an infrared camera diagnostic and when there wasn't. So half the thousands of homes had an infrared diagnostic, half did not. Five times more likely to install draft proofing and air sealing when the infrared camera was involved. And very significantly, think of these numbers. 75% of the Bristol residents who were shown thermal imaging took action. That's behavior change. And we don't use thermal imaging in this country yet still, even though I predicted it. What, what, no one was listening to me. I knew this, I knew the impact was when you see a thermal image, the experience is I'm seeing defects. It's not like, oh, you probably should have more insulation. I don't know what to do with that as a homeowner. Okay, eventually I get around to it. But you show me this and say your house is defective. Should we leave it defective? That's a whole other conversation. And we're always having the wrong discussion. We're trying to sell more insulation. When really what people emote about is the most expensive asset they own and it's defective or it's not working right, the propensity to fix and address and take action, change behavior is many fold, 5X in this case with the infrared camera. So this is the experience of cold floors. This is an infrared camera showing the very traditional, way too common, uninsulated banjoist configuration. How much easier will it be for this window company to go to the neighbors of this brownstone and say, look at what we did for your neighbor versus saying, hey, I just did your neighbor's house with windows. Can I put windows in your house? Think of the impact of the salesperson selling the R7 window. This is a Zolo window, which is a great window. But the Zolo window guy, if he goes next door and says, here's, here's your neighbor's house, here's yours. Any interest in new windows? How much skill and expertise does the buyer need? How much building science knowledge do, do the buyers need? This is just emotional stuff. This is experience-based. What I love about this picture is I left the historic doors. Why do I love this picture so much? It's a only indication that the heat's still on in this freaking building. We've got the door showing all the heat going on. Otherwise, these windows are just amazing. So you kind of get where I'm coming from. And the same thing with moisture. You know, without kick out flashing, hey, can we, when I do your roofing, can I add kick out flashing? It'll be another 100 bucks. So maybe it'll only cost $6 for the kick out flashing. But you, you have a motion working for you to show the what you can't see without the experience of seeing what it looks like, making the invisible visible. 95% of windows leak. So maybe if you're replacing windows and you want to upserve your client, if you want to help them better and do a full window replacement and also flash the windows, all you need to show is a defect. Your windows are leaking. I can only do that with a full window replacement. Would you agree? that you don't want that kind of moisture in your walls. More importantly, you'll never be able to insulate the walls because then once you insulate and you have that moisture behind it, now you're asking for trouble. So all this builds on everything else, words, questions, experiences, all do that. Now, uh, when we, Talk about building new homes. A lot of production builders got this figured out, how to stage and do homes and sell the, you know, the elevations and the interiors. We have this part figured out, right? We just stage the homes and we do a great job. It's the invisible part that we struggle. These, this kind of technology display just doesn't work. It's too complex, it's too hard, it's too much work for the consumer. This is an incredible amount of work. This is a deconstructed home. Um, 
one builder did. It was creative, but it, it's just way too much. You don't have to, you, you just have to create experience that nails what a buyer cares about. This is trying to create a museum around building science. It's not your job selling homes. So I'm building a SIP house and I